over the next five weeks, we're going straight to our network of experienced buyers agents in each state for some local insight. I am so excited. Here we are in week three of our state-based expert series. This week, our experts fill us in on how vendor disclosure is handled in their state, and it's an absolute eye-opener. In this episode, we're tackling vendor disclosure. What that means is what the owner and their agent has to tell you as a buyer. And this is one of the areas of property legislation that really baffles us. (laughs) There is such a broad range of disclosure requirements from very little to almost enough. Yet no state is really comprehensive in this area. So you have to know what you need to know and what you don't know to avoid massive mistakes. Welcome to your first home buyer guide, the podcast for first home buyers who want to get it right. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mums. But that's a good thing because between us we've got over 40 years experience and we are going to share with you bucket loads of stories about avoidable mistakes. Together we're going to make sure that you get unbiased and real information that you can rely on so you can get where you want to be without missing a step. And we've got loads of great tips for you in this episode. And if you'd like more useful tools, head over to the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. There you'll find free checklists so you can download a free mini course on how to price a property and our where to buy workshop for only $39. Priceless stuff, really. Bargain. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode, here's the boring bit, the disclaimer. You of course know that nothing in this podcast is to be taken as personal advice. We always recommend getting the advice of an expert in their field of expertise. Now we've done our very best to ensure that the content is correct at the time of recording, but things change. So check with the relevant government authority or your advisors to get the most up-to-date information. Now, you may notice that we're just talking about states here. We recognise there are two territories in Australia. There's the Northern Territory and the ACT. Now, we haven't included experts from those two territories for two reasons. One, Northern Territory, we actually don't know any buyers agents up there. And two, when it comes to the Australian Capital Territory, well, the laws are almost identical to New South Wales. So you can pretty much rely on what I say for New South Wales goes for there too. Can you please introduce yourself? We'd love to know who you are and where you buy. I'm Megan Wells, buyer's agent and founder and principal of Property Pursuit Buyer's Agents in Brisbane. My name is Catherine Skinner and I'm a buyer's agent here in Adelaide. I'm the director of National Property Buyers, South Australian office. Um, I have been in business here for eight years now. Um, Really grateful and love what I do, being able to help people buy property. My name's Samantha Spilsbury. I'm director and buyer of Buyers Agents Tasmania. We offer a statewide service for both investors and owner. A lot of our clients are relocators. So whether they're retiring or new families moving here, it's probably where our niche is, is to help them settle in. I have had my business for three years and that's how long I've worked in the buyer's agency realm. And prior to that, I've worked in property management for over 10 years. Uh, so my name's Jared McCabe. I'm a director at Wakeland Property Advisory. Um, we're a uh, boutique buying service uh, and vendor advisory service in Melbourne. Uh, I've been here, well, the company started in March 1995, so 28-odd years. There's a lot of experience within the business. Um, we focus very much much on asset selection as a big part of what we do and what we look for. Uh, buying the, the right property is extremely important. And obviously, everyone wants to get it for the best price they possibly can. Um, but if you select the wrong property in the first place, uh, then that can be a, a bigger issue. So we're very, we're very focused on asset selection and education as well. Hi, my name's Ben Lamas. I'm a buyer's agent in Western Australia for Acumentus Buyer's Agents. What information must a vendor disclose in your state? So in New South Wales, there's quite a high standard of vendor disclosure. You've got prescribed documents that need to be added to the contract of sale. So one of those is a title search, and that contains information about who actually owns the property, whether there's a mortgage on it, 
whether there's easements or other encumbrances, right? Then also there needs to be a deposited plan. So that shows basically uh, there's usually like a, a bit of a street plan showing all the lots on the street or if it's um, in strata, there's a strata plan and it shows literally what you're buying. Um, it's not as good as a survey, but it sort of gives you an idea and you can find out the land size from that as well. The other document is a sewer diagram. Very important. If you want to put a pool in, um, you want to know where the sewer line is. So the sewer diagram, then there's also, um, documents. So if there are easements or anything like that, there's a document that shows all the instruments relating to those easements, um, burdens and those sorts of things on a property. And the fifth thing is a zoning certificate. So in the olden days, we used to call it the 149. Now it's called the 10.7. And so that contains, you know, uh, that's that's a doc document from the council telling you whether it's being, um, you know, the zoning of it and also whether it's in a flood zone, bushfire zone, those sorts of things. Um, also some information about what sort of development you can do on the property. If it's strata, there's two additional documents because there's both the the lot that you're purchasing plus the actual strata plan for the whole complex. And there's also a couple of documents and things such as um, smoke alarm declaration and uh, whether your pool's compliant or non-compliant, you know, they need to tell you that as well. Not a lot, to be honest, in Queensland, a uh, lot less than we'd like. But the contract, um, generally the contract is that you is used is the REIQ standard form contract that has been approved by the Queensland Law Society. It contains information about the real property description. It contains the land size, and that is an approximate land size. Has the owner details, the buyer details, any registered easements. Uh, whether the property has smoke alarms, a safety switch, any QCAT disputes around fences or or other matters, and a pool safety certificate. So there's not an awful lot of disclosure, uh, and that's for freehold or Torrens Title Properties. There is a little bit more disclosure when it comes to strata or body, body corporate. Um, there are a few extra documents that come in. In South Australia, any purchaser entering into a contract will be issued with the Form 1. Now, a Form 1 is similar to a Section 32 in some other states, which includes a whole range of due diligence items that a purchaser needs to be aware of. So they include things like your certificate of title, any easements, encumbrances listed on the property, all planning and approvals for the lifetime of the property that are in place, um, all of your SA water information, your council rates, your uh, emergency services levies, your strata information, any absolutely anything to do with the property that is held at the titles office or with the council will be provided within that Form 1 document. So that is a huge amount of disclosure that needs to be included. Um, within there as well, you've got your pool compliance, which you need a certificate in place prior to settlement if you don't already have one, um, as well as things like if there's been a, a death or a crime that has taken place in the property, a vendor is supposed to disclose that. Um, there have been instances where they haven't um, and said that they weren't aware of these things, but um, legally they're supposed to provide disclosure of it all. In Tasmania... Uh, a vendor doesn't need to disclose any information to us what, when buying a property. So when you are to purchase, you'll get a contract that's very basic and you'll also get the title searches if you're lucky, which will bring up for you things like easements, if there's any caveats on the property, things like that. That will bring show up on your title searches. But if you're wanting information from like council or anything like that, if there's been an extension, you would need to add additional clauses in to get that information. And that would be at the buyer's cost? Yes. Yeah. So um, the solicitor or conveyancer needs to run those checks for you, but yeah, it'd be at, be at their cost. In Victoria, it's pretty detailed. Um, as part of the contract of sale, there's what's called a vendor statement or section 32, which uh, is a major part of the contract and has a lot of information in it. Um, this tends to disclose information that impacts the value of the property, and it includes, among other things, a certificate of title, um, as well as the plan of subdivision, which stipulates uh, the ownership of the property, but also the land size, the measurements, that type of thing, and then the easements, covenants, um, restrictions over the property. Um, you need to supply, the, or the document also includes any services connected to the land, 
um, a planning statement. So that will go over the zoning, any overlays, perhaps heritage, um, environmental, those types of things. It will include certificates from relevant authorities. So the local council, water authorities, Vic Roads, um, State Revenue Office, and if applicable, honest corporation certificates and annual general meeting minutes um, that that may have that will, that will have been conducted in the last twelve months, um, and then they, these documents will all outline any outgoings, levies, notices, um, permits, insurance, and any plans that might be affecting the property. Other things included are building permits, which have been issued in the previous or seven years. Um, and then if required, any uh, occupancy certificates, final inspections, uh, um, and then the, any other insurance documents. So there's quite a bit that goes into the um, the Section 32 of Vendor Statement. In Western Australia, their knowledge and ability, uh, the condition of the building, uh, any compliance certificates, RCDs, uh, electrical compliance, any repairs or maintenance that have been done on the building, any defects that they're aware of, of in, in the property, connection to uh, sewer, um, the status of any septic tanks uh, for the property, any rights and obligations or disputes or things that aren't registered on title that might have been uh, disputes that might have occurred relating to the property. That they're all the items that really need to be disclosed prior to sale. Does that level of disclosure seem like enough to you? In Queensland, no, it does not. Um, it, it it just seems quite and you know and the basis of property law in Queensland is caveat emptor, which is in in literal terms, let the buyer beware. Um, and and I get that that's kind of the premise of property law up here, but it is it's just simply not enough for a seller not to have to declare things that they know about the property or have to have had made investigations themselves and give those to to willing buyers who are trying to make a really big decision about whether this is the right property for them or not and and matters that might actually affect what the property is actually worth and how much they should pay. In New South Wales, despite the fact that we do uh, vendors in this state do have to provide more information than in most other jurisdictions, I still don't think it's enough. For example, if you have a renovated property and it's within the homeowner's warranty period, yes, they do need to have that certificate of that um, homeowner's warranty included in the contract, but they don't have to put an occupation certificate, they don't have to provide a survey, and yet they should have all of those sorts of things. So that's just one example of where really it could go further. In South Australia, I feel like we've got a very strong level of disclosure that essentially helps protect a purchaser and make them really aware of what they're going into, provided they've got someone who can review the document for them because it is very lengthy. It can be very confusing. And as long as they have a conveyancer or a professional go through and provide all of the relevant information to them, they should be protected. In Tasmania, I don't believe buyers have very much protection. There's a lot more information they could they could get. And unfortunately, sales agents do push that you just go in with no conditions to get to get the contract mm. signed and that's what buyers think they need to do to get that to get a property unfortunately so I do think you know if we could get additional information that is required across the board would be very beneficial I, I do think it's pretty good it's pretty comprehensive with what we mm. get in Victoria um there's still things that as a buyer you need to go and investigate yourself but it, from a, um, a a reasonable perspective, I think it's quite good. It's the forms are fairly comprehensive, and as a buyer's agent here in Western Australia, I always ask for the disclosure statement to be provided prior to making an offer. Um, however, I'm not always furnished with a copy, um, but in most cases, an agent will provide it, and it is relatively sufficient for us to. Uh, to have a look at that property, but we're usually relying on our own due diligence in order to cover up everything that we need on the property, title searches, discussions with federal, local and state government agencies and building and pest inspections in order to ascertain the status of the property. How hard is it for the average buyer to get this additional information? In New South Wales, it can be difficult to get some of those additional things that would make um, buying a property much 
more transparent. For example, with renovation documents, you know, a lot of vendors, they just say, oh, I don't know where I put them. I lost them. And it's like, oh, really? Your record keeping is pretty bad. So if they say that they don't have them and then we have to try to go to council to get them, we need to lodge an information request and usually that's 21 days. Most campaigns to sell a property, are, well, most properties are expected to be sold in less than 21 days. So it can be difficult. And so this is where you need to know what to ask for and who to lean on to get that information. In Queensland, it's all there. It's all available in most cases unless it's missing and then, you know, it's pretty hard to find these things. But you have to know what to ask and of whom. And I think that's the challenging thing for buyers in Queensland. Council searches can take maybe 14 days, 21 days to come come back. And and those those sorts of searches include things that you in other states you're given as part of the contract. It might be, you know, uh, whether there's a main road going to be built nearby or whether there's contaminated land. It may be that there's an undisclosed or unregistered easement, which is where your sewer or stormwater drain actually traverses the block of land and may impact on whether you can do a pool or an extension and how you can do those things. So a lot of these things. If you don't know who to ask and when and the right time to do it and you haven't got a contract condition that allows you to terminate the contract if it's a conditional contract, then you don't have any termination rights if there are any adverse findings. Um, And if the condition isn't long enough and you don't get your searches back, then you're sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place. So it's actually sometimes hard to get the information in the time frame that you need it. In South Australia, it's relatively easy to get additional information. So if there's anything omitted from the Form 1 that you want further information from, um, Planning SA here in South Australia cover everything. So a quick call to them, they will forward information through and it's generally pretty easy to find. In Tasmania, to get the additional information, it's um, naturally harder to get the condition approved by the vendor you really have to fight harder for it because we need it at least 21 days to get the information from council and so that's quite a long time for a buyer or for a vendor sorry to have the property with that condition of that that time frame so it can it can take some time to get the information you will eventually get it but the time is at least 21 days sometimes 28 days depending on to, depending on where you need to get the information from Another reason to use a buyer's agent. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so in Victoria, it probably depends on really the the agent um, or the vendor um, or the solicitor of conveyancer that you're dealing with. Um, we had one fairly recently where there was a neighbouring property that had um, th- there was being extension done on a on a house, and we wanted to see the um, the plans of that property to see whether there'd be any overlooking or any issues, and we spoke to the agent. The agent said, oh, we can't get that information. Um, we had our conveyancer speak to the other side's, or sorry, our solicitor speak to the other side's conveyancer. And they said, no, we've investigated that and we can't get access to it. So we rang the council um, and the council's, um, they said, we can't uh, email it to you, but we can send you a screenshot. And so we got the the two, with one phone call to the right person, we got the, um, the floor plan, but we also got the, um, the angles and the... Um, facade so that we could see where the windows sat and whether there was any overlooking. So that that allowed us to do it. So if you know where to go and who to call, you can get extra information. In most instances, it's relatively easy. The only case is where um, older buildings that are registered uh, with councils, they don't have a historical bank of plans of, of properties. And sometimes an addition may be made to a a property and the councils don't have records of of an addition if it's like 20 or 30 years old. Uh, And then when you go to apply to the council to see those uh, plans, you need the permission of the current vendor in order to get the information because you as a buyer in Western Australia don't have the authority to gain that confidential information. So that can become a little bit difficult. Uh, usually we're relying on the disclosure of the vendor to provide that information about when the addition was done, does it comply with the building standards at the time? So that can be difficult. What would you like to see as mandatory in your state? 
In New South Wales, I believe that there are plenty of other documents that could be requested without putting an additional burden on the vendor. Now, for example, a survey. It'd be so good to have a survey in every contract. Then you really know exactly where the boundaries are of the property you're buying and also whether or not you're encroaching on other people's land or they're encroaching on yours. But that that's a cost to get a survey. And I know that there's this sort of attitude that they shouldn't put that burden on owners. The reality is, though, if you have renovated your property, you had to get a survey. You had to get a survey at the beginning when you lodged your plans, and you had to get a survey if you got an occupation certificate once you finished your renovation. So I know these things actually exist. And so, therefore, I think it should be reasonable to expect that if anybody has done substantial work to their property, that that would be a mandatory inclusion or a mandatory disclosure as well. Likewise, with an occupation certificate. It's something that they really should have got when they finish their renovation. So I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that they provide that in the contractor sale. In Queensland, I'd like to see an awful lot more disclosure. You know, similar to what is in New South Wales and, and Victoria. And, and and the level of disclosure that are in that, that in those states is a lot more there is a lot more protection for the buyer, or there's a lot more information available to the buyer. And, and I like that because you go into uh, making an offer on a property or assessing a property with a lot more information than ending up on the back foot and doing, you know, making an offer that's conditional, getting your information back and then trying to renegotiate or terminate if what you found was not in line with your expectations at all. So if if in Queensland there was an ability and, and there's certainly a groundswell of, of interest from buyers agents, from the industry body, but there's a lot of pushback from owners in not wanting to have to disclose these things and actually liking the fact that they have to push it back to, they can push it back to the buyer and say, you need to make your own investigations around that. In South Australia, I'd really like to see it mandatory that there is some form of restriction in terms of underquoting. So we're still seeing um, agents that are underquoting for private treaty sales, not necessarily auctions. And in reality, especially for your entry level buyers that are sitting in your sub six six fifty thousand dollar category, it is very difficult for them to get to gauge a true indication of what a property is going to sell for and there's no legalities around what an agent can quote in tasmania it would be great to see just to get the house plans as mandatory so you can see if extensions are you know have been approved you know certificates occupancy certificates um would be great just as a starting point just so the buyer knows that they are protected somewhat. In Victoria, I'm probably not sure that there's much more that I would say that I think we need as mandatory. I think it's pretty good. I think there, there needs to be still some form of onus on the buyer to do their own investigations to a point. So with the um, you you do get a lot of information given to you as part of uh, the Section 32 and vendor statements in Victoria. So it's not just a matter of understanding Understanding, oh, sorry, of having that received that information, but it's ac- absolutely about understanding what that information means and how you need to translate that and how it impacts on your decision, not only how you'll use the property going forward, but how any future potential user may want to use it. So that just because you may not be looking to um, carry out a development or an extension doesn't mean someone down the track may not be. And so the information that's included within the section 32 may stipulate that and that may have some restrictions on where your value sits that you need to take into account when assessing things yourself. For me, uh, the mandatory disclosure statement, I think that should be provided, uh, that should be mandatory, that shouldn't be an optional item in Western Australia. If you're a legitimate and honest agent or vendor selling a property, you should be able to provide that with no problem why they have to make it optional, I've got no idea. All right. Now, I'm sure that you can understand why this was the one where we learnt the most because every state has such a different regime when it comes to vendor disclosure. But you can understand why it's so important you know what the agent has to tell you versus what you need to go and find out for yourself. And no doubt you're probably sitting now there thinking, Caveat M Tor, are you kidding? I have to work this all out for myself. It's nuts. You know, you're buying such an expensive thing and it's like there's not even a warranty. There's not even an instruction manual that comes with the appliances. 
<laughs> oh, dear. So next week we're back with our state expert series. And in this one, we're going to be tackling strata. That's units, townhouses, villas next week. In this episode, we've covered a very small part of our 10-step online course for first-time buyers. If you would like to learn more about the process and how to buy without making a mistake, then head over to our website, www.homebuyeracademy.com.au. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode. And if you like what you've heard today, please give us an iTunes review. Five stars would be wonderful. It will help others find us as well. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with some more priceless stuff.